Hello, my name is Tony. The 70s were my favourite decade for movies, closely followed by the 60s. When the 80s dawned, things started to get a bit more fragmented for me. My cinema attendance tapered off dramatically and I OD'd on VHS rentals. There weren't too many films I felt I wanted to go out of my way to see. Don't get me wrong, there were still some astonishing movies being made, but less that spoke or appealed to me all that intensely or directly. And that anticipatory buzz for a new flick began decreasing in intensity. I used to buy film news and reviews magazines and store in memory all the forthcoming releases I wanted to see. That stopped. Fast forward to now and in this arid desert of cinematic insignificance and substandard quality, there is literally nothing I feel motivated to leave the house for. I haven't seen Under Fire for the best part of 40 years. Premier channel subscriber and Patreon patron Numinous mentioned it and the lack of attention it seemingly gets. I realised I hadn't thought about it in decades, which is odd because because I remember going to the cinema to watch it first, then re-watching it on VHS later, both rewarding experiences. After that, it was as if it was almost scrubbed from existence, was never brought up or mentioned again. Almost like one of those false implanted memories successfully identified as fake and wiped from the consciousness, because it never really happened. Now if I was given to conspiracy theories, I could suggest to you that there is some nefarious plot by big government or the security services afoot to suppress the film for some reason. In fact, I was entertaining doing just that, until a contact told me he had an officially released Blu-ray and said I could borrow it. And I would have, if only that very night he hadn't fallen off the roof of his house, paralytically drunk, whilst trying to rescue his cat, Mr. Snuggles, and he landed arse first on the ornamental spike of a gazebo in his garden below. Funny thing is, now I think about it, he was teetotal, acrophobic, didn't own a cat called Mr. Snuggles, and never had a gazebo or a garden. Anyway, I had his spare set of keys, and after the police had finished up and taken away the crime scene tape, I let myself in. The Under Fire Blu-ray was nowhere to be found. Luckily, he had a habit of copying all his movies with illegal copyright busting software and burning them to disc with a cracked version of Nero. He kept the backups in a hidden storage vault behind the fake fireplace. So, what do you know? I got to see it, and now I'm going to do the review. Especially as that annoying panel van across the street, the one with the black tinted windows, seems to have driven off. It's been there a lot lately. Under Fire opens on a military conflict in Chad in Africa in early 1979. Russell Price, Nick Nolte, is a photojournalist capturing shots of rebel militia transporting arms on elephants and enduring air assault from an attack chopper. After the fight, he hitches a ride with a military convoy where he encounters Oates, Ed Harris, a soldier he's met before in other theatres of war. They always greet each other in the same way. What the fuck are you doing here? Oates is an ambiguous character, either an independent mercenary or CIA a insurgent. It's never made clear. Back at his hotel, Price attends a farewell party for his boss, Alex Grazier, Gene Hackman, who is given up covering foreign conflicts to take a job as a news anchor in the States. Also attending is Alex's girlfriend, Claire Strider, Joanna Cassidy, another journalist. Alex and Claire have a fractious relationship and are in the process of splitting up. Alex's article on the conflict, along with Russell's photography, land them the front cover of Time magazine. The gang move on to a smart hotel in war-torn Nicaragua as part of an international press corps. The incumbent president Somoza, René Enrique, is pitted against a rebel faction led by Raphael, a shadowy underground figure who has never been photographed. Russell fixates on meeting the rebel leader and snapping his clock. Russell and Claire meet dapper local French by Marcel Jaisy, Jean-Louis Trintignant, who is associated with Somoza. He's pimping out his casual girlfriend, a former Miss Panama beauty queen, Jenny Gago, to the president. He suggests Raphael might be found in the town of Lyon. Going there, they meet with rebel forces led by a baseball-obsessed Pedro Eloy Casados. Drawn into a ferocious rooftop battle with government forces who have commandeered the local church, Russell photographs the fighting which ends when Pedro pitches a grenade into the church bell tower, killing the soldiers within. Surveying the carnage in the bell tower, Russell is surprised to find Oates playing dead among the bodies. What the fuck are you doing here? What the fuck are you doing here? He doesn't turn his old acquaintance in. When Russell and Claire and the rebels leave the church, Oates snipes Pedro from the roof, shooting him in the back. A photo shoot with Russell reluctantly taking snaps of Somoza posing with Miss Panama is interrupted with the news that Raphael is dead, killed by government troops. Russell and Claire are approached by the rebels and taken upriver to a remote stronghold, where they are told they will meet Raphael, who is apparently not dead. Only he is, and the rebels want Russell to photograph his corpse, making it look like he isn't, you follow? At 
At first, Russell is dismissive, but after some thought and taking pictures around the camp of the locals and the rebel militia, impressed by their faith and fortitude, he agrees. The ruse works as the photos are distributed in leaflet drops and to news outlets. It is hoped this will be enough to keep the rebel movement on course towards victory. Alex returns to Nicaragua in the hope of scooping an interview with Raphael. He discovers that Russell and Claire are now sleeping together. The two men attempt to travel into the war zone where they are detained by government troops. They encounter Oates, who has just participated in the execution of a number of innocent civilians and some rebel militia. They were individuals Russell had photographed at Raphael's camp. Oates tells him that they were identified from the snaps he took, which had obviously been stolen from Russell by the Frenchman Jay-Z. It's not long before a suspicious Alex pressurises Russell and Claire into admitting that Raphael is in fact dead, and they have violated journalistic ethics by participating in the ruse. Despite his anger, he decides to write and submit an alternative article about Jay-Z and keep stum. When he and Russell journey again into the war zone to interview Jay-Z, they find many streets cut off by government soldiers. They get lost, and Alex goes to ask some soldiers for directions back to the hotel. Russell immerses himself in taking photographs of their surroundings, capturing on film the very moment when the soldiers, in a paranoid state, shoot and kill Alex. Russell runs for his life, shot and wounded, trapped in the war zone, pursued by the desperate military. Back at the hotel, Somoza holds a brief press conference alleging that the rebels have murdered Alex. He realises that if it becomes known his government troops have executed a famed US journalist, his regime is done for. Claire drives into the war zone to find Russell. They meet up and are now both trapped. Making it to Jay-Z's home, they find him held at gunpoint by three young and nervous rebels. The rebels know that Jay-Z has been helping the government to target them, but he remains arrogant and unrepentant. They execute him and leg it. As the government forces are looking for Russell but not Claire, they split up with her taking the incriminating role of film. Unable to reach the hotel due to a military roadblock, Claire entrusts the film to a young boy with a bicycle. Later that night, hoping to find Russell in a roughshod medical facility, Claire sees on a small portable black and white TV images of Alex's death being broadcast. President Somoza has the bodies of his father and brother exhumed from the family crypt and with Miss Panama on his arm, heads off with his entourage and the corpses to exile in Miami, Florida. Government troops have withdrawn and the rebels have taken control. Claire arrives at the now deserted hotel and finds Russell has made it back there in one piece. In the street celebrations, Russell once again encounters Oates, dressed in a bright floral shirt to blend in. See you in Thailand, he says to Russell in parting. Russell and Claire head off to leave the country. Under Fire is the best film Canadian-born director Roger Spottiswood ever made. It's difficult to rationalise his making of this film with some of his later efforts, Turner and Hooch, Stop or My Mom Will Shoot, Tomorrow Never Dies. Although in fairness, he did give us the rather superb Sidney Poitier action thriller Deadly Pursuit, which is a wonderful piece of classic adventure mayhem. Under Fire is a war film minus a sustained emphasis on battle scenes and heroics. It's a political thriller which isn't over-politicised. War is tricked out as messy and coordinated, casually horrifying. The victims, those who suffer the most, the innocent civilians caught in the indiscriminate churn of its mindless wake. There are echoes of Casablanca to have and have not and for whom the bell tolls, with a reduction of the soft focus romanticism of those pieces. War is dirty, it's obscene, and the complexities blurred and twisted, further obscured by those factions exploiting it for their own ends. External governments, agents like Oates and Jay-Z, and the press corps themselves, who go out and get in harm's way for the sake of a story or an image. In some respect, it's a companion piece and forerunner to Oliver Stone's Incendiary Salvador, which would come along three years later. Incidentally, Salvador is the only Oliver Stone film I actually like, but that's a story for another time. Spottiswood keeps everything tight and sharply focused, organises things with a great eye for detail, framing many events through the lens wielded by Nolte's character, the Nikon camera freezing on faces and occurrences with a critical unblinking directness. The atmosphere throughout is one of uncertainty, instability, the feeling that impending death or disaster could strike anyone at any time, and this keeps the audience on its toes. The sense of continuous lurking danger and threat skillfully constructed, escalated for key sequences, such as when Nolte goes on the run from the militia, ducking behind flimsy makeshift fences, his pursuers only a hair's breadth away. Under fire puts you through the mill, even in the quieter moments when Russell and Claire are transported upriver, you're always expecting something bad to happen suddenly and without warning, which I guess is what war is pretty much like.
The cornerstone is the performance of the actors who never hit a bum note. Nolte's character is reckless, taking insane risks to get that perfect shot, a gruff Marlboro voice man's man, but no all action hero. He doesn't shoot anyone or beat anyone up, is not especially macho and brave, more likely to take to flight than fight. And running away is no bad thing here. Hang around, someone will put a bullet in you. It's a finely judged turn by him, machismo light with a humanistic undercurrent. Very Bogart. Hackman is never less than excellent, injecting haunting notes of wispy despair and regret into his role as the hard-nosed newsman, who's burned out with all the globe trotting through endless trouble spots of the world. The disintegration of his relationship with Claire, born out of an insoluble conflict between his desire to stop and settle down and hers to keep going. His prospective job as a news anchorman, probably just a pipe dream. He doesn't seem to have either the look or the temperament for it, something he probably can't admit to himself, but just as probably knows to be true. And as for Joanna Cassidy, I'll cite the obvious and comment on just how gorgeous and sexy she is because the superficial male sexist in me won't have it any other way and I'd hate to disappoint in any event. She grabs her role with such tender and mature conviction, dazzling with a fascinating, multi-layered and wonderfully textured portrayal of a career woman with a heart and soul and a deeply romantic spirit. Humanity and all its complex facets are the key and the three leads embody it in spades. Ed Harris, magnificent in support as the light-hearted but thoroughly ruthless and indestructibly lethal oats is something of a revelation of duality. He's either the best friend you ever had or the most nightmarish nemesis, a cavalier monster with a love for carnage or a necessary evil with a best interest manifesto at heart popping up when you least expect. We'll never really know. Harris plays it for all it's worth, I do know that much. Finally, Jean-Louis Trintignant as the loose Jay-Z is a master class of lounge lizard sleaze and creeping malevolence. The sort of joke you shake hands with, you count your fingers and then your toes, just in case he made a move you didn't see coming. The script by Clayton Froman and Ron Shelton has a lively musculature and some whip-smart dialogue going for it. I found the score by Jerry Goldsmith something of a disappointment, overdoing the ethnic sonics, too many pan pipes and not enough grit and punch for my liking. A bit more snap would have been welcome. Cinematography by the late John Alcott, who worked for Kubrick on A Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon and The Shining, is pretty darn fabulous. Captivating with collages of black and white stills, high bright sun vistas, distant pyrotechnics, and an up close and personal intimacy of both a romantic and violent nature. Visually, the film is really hard to fault. What we have is this, an intelligent, thoughtful, character-driven, exciting and frequently thrilling exercise in depicting the emotional, political and physical cost and legacy of modern warfare. War is seen as a constant and evolving state, a process that doesn't stop, just switches location, island hops to a different geographical arena and kicks off again. Many of the same players like Oates and Russell and Claire follow it around and do what they do on repeat until they move on to the next charnel house or butcher's yard. The pun Punchline, the one that sums it up, is Oat Cheery Auf Zain Au Revoir Till We Meet Again. See you in Thailand. The only way war ever ends is if the whole world collectively says stop, and that's probably not very likely to happen anytime soon. At least it hasn't, for the last 300,000 years at any rate. It's something of a mystery to me why it doesn't seem to get much attention now and hasn't done since it was first released. It's a bloody good film, did reasonable box office, is well worth watching, and you won't find anything comparable, superior in an intellectual or creative sense being made and released today. The emotional intelligence, integrity and sincerity it embodies an added incentive. I'd recommend it, pilgrims. Thanks for your time and attention, I appreciate it. Please consider hitting like, don't like, leave a comment, subscribing, checking out my Patreon page, or sending a small gratuity with the very important thanks button below. Well, better sign off now. Hey, I noticed that black van is back. Why is the side door open?